Welcome everybody. Oh, Paul's trying to pull up Rain the Park like the old earlier episodes. Yeah. I love yeah, the flower crazy. girl. And there they are, the cow sills. Rain the Park that's and other things. School. You know, right. it doesn't sound mm -hmm. it, but we are approaching our 100th episode. I think this no is- No way. Way. I know it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Too bad we didn't have emojis that could just jump up in front of us right now. Wait, but wait, but wait, but wait, but wait. We have time to prepare. Wow, wow, Can we have ourselves wow, a party? Wow. <laughs> you know what? What we'll do is we'll get to Nate. Isn't that our editor? And we'll say, uh, we'll start mentioning something. And uh, like what you just did. Now, Nate, yeah. if he can't make emoji. a graphic, you can just yeah. edit it in. Take us we, off. He could just pour a bunch of graffiti down on us. Oh, yeah. Rain graffiti. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that, too. Isn't that cute? Oh. Hey, so hello, everybody. <laughs> we are thrilled. We, of course, right. um, I know you guys are going to hear this episode. And when you hear this episode, we will be dead smack in the middle of the Happy Together Tour. Oh, I, I don't think I can do that this year, guys. <laughs> it will be July. It will be July. But we're going to share with you what, what we kind of go through to get ready for this tour, because that's what day it is today. Today, we are recording this on May 23rd or 24th. Okay, so next Tuesday, we leave town for the Happy Together Tour. Susan, what's the very first thing that comes crashing into your brain when it is finally ready to get, literally ready to go on the tour? Dead plants. Dead, Dead plants. plants comes into my, my brain. Dead okay, so every plants, summer. because we always go in. We always go in springtime, correct? In springtime, I always want to plant. I am a creature of the planet. I buy all these beautiful plants at springtime. I leave them here, and God bless my husband. But I do come back, and they're often dead. That's okay. one of the first things that happens. Second okay. thing that happens is. How many years has it been since I got an outfit for Happy Together and do I need to switch it up? Because every time I look at pictures of us, the only person who's changing their outfit year in and year out is moi. All the bucks look the same, all the councils, everybody's the same but me. So that comes up, spending money on clothes. Um, how's my hair? How gray am I? How are the wrinkles this year? How's the neck looking? These are the things that come up for me at Happy Together. Bob, how about you? Oh, I'll go next. Um, I have to mentally prepare for the bus mostly more than anything. And uh, I okay. even have tell us dream. about that, please. I even had a dream of, of, of the bus coming for me, but it has scary face on the front of it. So because in the bus, this is going to be home for three months and I'm going to sleep in a berth on the bottom with Paul just above me and Susan above him uh, in the middle of this bus. And it's the size of a coffin, a little larger because you got to fit. Um, <laughs> and it's got a curtain and three walls. I need to sleep with the curtain open facing out. So I'm going to sleep on my left side because you have to put your feet toward the front. You're not allowed to have your head toward the front because if the bus crashes, if your head's toward the front, you're going to die. If your feet are toward the front, you're just going to be in a wheelchair, lose your legs or whatever's going to happen in that way. And that's better. So I have to sleep on my left side every single night. So for three months, and that's I'm going to have to undo all of this in September, but that's getting ahead of the story. I'm sorry to take so much time. Uh, oh, it's good. And I have, on top of it, claustrophobia. There will be three episodes this summer of a minor panic attack where I will have inadvertently turned, and I can't find, <laughs> I can't find the, wind, the curtain uh, air, and I'm hitting wood, and it's pitch black. In Poor these baby. Months which is good because you can go to sleep because you don't see the wood right above you, one inch above you, the top of the coffin. Another thing that'll happen is Paul will turn during the night, uh, during the tour. And when Paul turns right above me, this is the only time I think of the structure of the birth. And <laughs> Paul's bottom solid is, are the bolts in tight? Is everything secure? If it came crashing on me, will I be able to just, quickly get out or what would happen if that happened you know and then the other thing wow. that if that happened to you bob i just yeah. want to say one thing if, if, if that oh i forgot what i was going to say it's kind of yeah, early he's going to come crashing down on you he's going to come crashing down, down and will he be able to get out in time no paul will and will he be out. able to get out in time and you were going to tell him why. paul's going to jump out he's going Write to it lift, down. he's going to lift his birth bottom off of my body and and throw it down while to, with one hand 
and save me. Wait, but anyway, he's gonna lift your birth with one but, hand while scooping you out. Go ahead, and, Paul we'll has the, and we'll be the new owners of the Happy Together tour. <laughs> yeah, <we will>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could uh, be a life saving <laughs> event. Anyway, um, the last thing is that so I will have a few nights sleeping where people will come out to the lounge and oh, what's Bob doing on the couch in the lounge he, and not in his birth? And that will have been that I got to get out of here. I got to get out of the right. birth and get out there. And so that's my main issue. Probably I want to say I feel really sad for you about that because it is a big part of our life sleeping every night. Go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. By September, this is by one week, I'm, I'm into the rhythm of the tour and this is all settled down. Oh, okay. interesting. It's all settled down. Okay. I just wait to get Because tired. there's two junk bunks and they're all up. One could be in the middle, one could be on the top. So there's an option for Bob to change his reality and go to a junk bunk and we make that his bunk the junk bunk. True that. Maybe he wouldn't that. be down in the dark. No, no. I've right. been in this same birth. This is my ninth <laughs> summer to live in this birth. Eighth, well, ninth, we missed one. Tenth. No, ninth. I'm going to turn 74. Ninth. I turned ninth. 60, 65 on the first one. Ninth. Yeah. So I, I can't change the birth. I'm, you know, I can't change. I oh, gotta okay. Sleep. Okay. I do have That's to sleep good. in that birth. That is my birth. And it's on the bottom. So the traffic's easy. <laughs> People inside this area, you don't hear anything going on in the lounge. And down there, I only see feet going back and forth. So. Well, we do have we do have kind of live active uh, activity on our podcast today. It's live. Would you like the live income from HTT Production? Yes, because we're talking about the tour, and and we've been putting out um, questions to our our leader. We won't say his name. He doesn't like to be identified, but um, our leader here says, as far as we ask the questions, when will the bus be there? Will it be there the day we fly in, which is usually day before, or will it be there day of when we leave? Right. And so we asked the unidentified production person, this question, and he replies, the buses will be in clear water on show day. Then the second question we ask the production person who will remain anonymous, who's on our bus? And the production person who remains anonymous replied, everybody. Oh. Okay. Oh, so just, apparently, just, we're, what? apparently we're doubling up on the births and, uh, <laughs> We're down to one bus, folks. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it. I don't know. Because we have wow. two buses. We have two I'm going to let the unidentified production person know he's been on our podcast. <laughs> oh, shit. Wow, we could. Well, he wouldn't come on a podcast. I wanted to do that. I thought about that, but he's unidentifiable. So but we can't we'll call have... him Nor. Uh, we'll, we'll ask right. Nor, which is his name. Right. Uh, I just had a power lowerage. My right, life Paul. And what, what do you do? I mean, do you have to organize? Oh, yeah, Polly, tell get us. Out of town? I get out of town when everybody leaves on Tuesday. I leave on Monday because I got to take this bus out of Central Oregon to a hotel in Portland and then from the hotel to the airport uh, the very next morning because early outs, I got to go over this mountain. Holy cow. But my, and that really is, I mean, as far as the tour goes, man, I'm good to go on anything and everything. I'm, I'm easy there. My problem is just like the first day, this bus ride, and then the cancellation or the, the uh, you know, the airlines screwing things up, you know, that is what just sends me, I'm constantly nervous until I get on that first leg and then just get out there. And then they've got to get me to my last spot. But if it cancels here, that means I've got I've got a lot to do to get there on time. And so and I'm very know, worried about that all the time. You deal with that all the time. That's why yeah. and there is yeah. almost not a time where Robert and I will arrive at an airport together successfully, calm, cool and collected and realize that our buddy Paul has been through the ringer all day. Yeah, so so, that's really my only issue. Paul's adventure is like getting through. You know how you feel after you finally get past TSA and you're at your gate, right? This feeling of getting through the airport procedure. This is a long TSA procedure for Paul over sisters yeah. Yeah. in Oregon. He's on the bus ride probably early in the morning going out on to his summer tour. Uh -huh. I yeah. tell you what I'm worried about this And the year. bus is real rickety. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, so dig this. So we we started Happy Together Tour nine freaking years ago, okay? Unbelievable. Yeah. And we are so excited. We cannot wait to see that bus, that bus, that bus. We must see this bus, the bus, the bus. Nine years later, Robert's having 
having nightmares of the bus with big smiley mean faces on it. Because now that's telling. I mean, what does that mean, Bob? Oh, it's it's all due to the birth in the bus. And that is I know. B- <laughs> B-E-R-T-H. And and that's just my subconscious. You know, like I I'm like Paul, just get me to it, give me a week, and I'll be cool. You know, I'll have my moments, but I'm I'm nine summers in. I got this, man. I turned 65 on the first tour. I'm turning 74 on this one. Wow. I got a Crazy. lot of it down. The eating, remember that first summer? Oh my God, I rolled into that tour the first summer and I rolled out twice as big as I rolled in because the food was everywhere. <laughs> and we didn't know it at first, right? It's like banana pudding and yeah. stuff you never saw in your life. And you go, this is so fun. Oh man, you're you killing learn, me. <laughs> you'll learn. Even you, Susan, we said maybe we should just eat the lunches and stop this dinner business for a while. And you just manage the food. You just do. You learn how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Listen, yeah. one of the things about HTT, you guys, we have to say this because, and I know it's a fact. It's a science fact. Paul Pufferfish would probably agree that we get a cardio workout every night. A 20 minute cardio. People get in the car and drive to a gym, make themselves go in and do that to live better. We have to do it every night, whether we want to or not. So we are exposed, right? Yeah. What does the literature say? Well, if you can exercise 20 minutes three times a week, you are good to go. Thank you. Right? Yeah. 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 And then, Uh, and then put inside of that, put inside of that. Ow. Whoa, my back is literally going out as we speak. Whoa, weird. Okay, and put in that. Holy crap. Oh, old people put stuff. In that. Yes. Oh, I see. I'm going to walk funny today. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I the know. stairs that we do, once you look at the end of your day, you've got 10 miles marked on your phone. It's, it's like, scary me. I tell so you, I got to say, maybe me. maybe our, our, long, our, our longevity has to do with HTT, is my point. But now, here's all right. Now, uh, now I'm going to say something good. Okay. The beauty of the tour is we are treated magnificently. We have, uh, when we roll in at 11, the crew, the hardest workers get to to this stage up. It takes hours and then they're going to have to take it down. And in that, and uh, uh, then the band has a sound check. We like to sit in the audience for sound check just because we don't do it, but the band does the sound check. And we didn't have to do that. We love it. They feed us well. They treat us well. It's absolutely not for everybody yeah. as rigorous as you could ever imagine, but but there is such goodness to it. And you have time. I watched Ozark one summer. I watched Ted Lasso one summer. You know, that kind of stuff is good. You do have personal time. There, There's personal, look, I have a, a very active life at home. I mean, I've got kids that live here. I've got grandkids. I mean, and you know, a, gra- a mother-in-law that's two blocks away. So every day is like being in Brooklyn more or less susan, when i leave here it's fun watching susan run her empire every day from the happy together tour. <laughs> i'm just no, saying I, I mean it, it, it well there is there is a thing we but at do, least yeah. when i get out there i mean when i hang you know it's like i get a moment that i don't have here for sure and and that's kind of a, a, a blessing and a curse it's, it's it's just hey look here's what i tell everybody we gotta have a job you're going to have a boss. You're going to have work situations. Everybody, you know, it's like, I have the best job, best boss and best work situation ever. If I'm going to have one, this is what I want. And she brings that beautiful attitude to the birth. Because when you look down where every the sleeping quarters of the bus, there'll be a glow coming from Susan's birth of Christmas lights and shelving and, and, and wall pa- birth wallpaper and uh, special pillows that was and blankets and everything. The girls kind of do this in their births. And uh, our bus has- but Listen, a- you, you might do well to take a candle. I know seeing the four, three sides of the walls might, you might try that this year. I've wanted it desperately to give you a little environment. I wouldn't be able to enjoy it because I go into the birth when I'm gonna go literally to sleep, I'm, I'm going. I don't want to go in there and not. I know, I know. Okay, no, I watch so you. I'd be asleep if anything was on. Yeah, no, it's not gonna work. <clears throat> and I get out right when I get. I out. understand and look. Our little system works. What, Polly? And the, and the interesting thing is, is that just ten or eleven years ago, we were all we were ever saying was, man, if we could just have four shows a month, 
<laughs> or man, if we could just have three shows a month, we could make this our life, you know, our living, and, right? <laughs> yeah. And we said that for a few years and then man, nine years ago, that, that prayer was answered and you got to totally. be careful of what you pray for you because we are now because nine years in with more shows than we ever did and older than we ever were. And literally, <laughs> that's the freaking the truth. Literally, in addition to we just want four shows a month, we knew about the Happy Together tour. We watched it go out yeah. every year without us, as all the groups oh, came yes. back and said, Yes, oh, we on that horrible. Tour. We should be on that tour, but we're the only ones that know that. They're trying to sell us and they can't. <laughs> you know, the councils, well, they, well remember the parkers? Yeah. Well, all right, whatever. But anyway, uh, no, nope, I don't. <laughs> but like I said, our we auditioned and passed the audition. So you're right. And it's amazing what has happened since then. That is so true. And and also one last point. You know, go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. I want to hear that point. Well, just one last point. Yes, we will have rhythm of the world. On the merch table, yes, we will be letting that available to the general public. That is true. All due respect to the sad, sad saga of Pledge Music. We will have happy uh, Rhythm of the World albums for people. Uh, and we will um, have the old CD and some pictures. All that will be happening. Uh, no, no formal meet and greets, as you know, guys, that there's just 24 people. They got to keep a block. Oh, now, yes. That was clarified by the, the undisclosed Production we want to remind well. everyone, he said, right, of June 23rd, June 20, now June 22nd is when the first leg of the Happy Together Tour ends, but we go to Minnesota to open for Peter Noon. We're so excited at the Liberty Bowl block party, um, and the doors open at five, and then September 8th, after the tour. And it's free. It's free. Oh, that's a free thing? The Liberty it's free. Party, the block party? Love yes. That. Yeah. Yeah, like it's going to be a pretty I love good it. thing. Yes, um, yes. September 8th just came in at the Golden Nugget. We are returning uh, for another round at the Golden Nugget in Las Vegas on September 8th. I think is a Friday. Um, love it. Yep, Friday. Always Black Friday. Friday's coming up next uh, January. But that that's all. We just want to make sure we alert people to where we're going to be and what we're up to. We do have yes. a guest today. Yeah, what we're doing. It sound it. But we do, is. and they're going to be here any second. We better say who it is. There's one coming. It is Ian yeah. Anderson of Jethro Tall. Bungle in the jungle. Thick as a brick. Jungle Ian buzz is all right bum, by bum, me. Bum, 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 all three, bum, of bum, us, bum. All three of us are blown away, of course, once more uh, by somebody <laughs> that's coming on our podcast. And... Uh, we think this because we can't believe they said yes yeah we yeah. think he's a genius oh guys yeah, can I, yeah. <laughs> wait can i ask a question here's one thing i always want to ask people that i always forget and i know we've, it's almost 100 shows and i'm just remembering to say this to us now but i always want to ask some of these bigger people do they even know who the cow hills are? Oh, no, no. <laughs> or, no. <laughs> I always want to know the cool people you, if they know who we are. But you're going to make somebody, I mean, I and I'm going to be honest, somebody's asked me, did you listen to my record? And I said, yes, when I didn't. You got to be careful with stuff like that. <laughs> and I acted like I did, you know, to be kind. But aren't you dying to know, aren't you dying to know if the guy who played the flute in, uh, 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 oh, Bob, how did it come about? How do, yeah, we, how do we even get him? Ian Anderson on our podcast. How, how well, did it come? It, it was through his his PR people, but we had had another artist with this company. I think it was, oh, I think it was uh, the Jonas Brothers dad. Oh, if Kevin. I'm not mistaken. Uh, I mean, and <laughs> they handle his press. And so he's, oh. look, we're one of many today. Look, he leaves for Spain. Um, probably the 26th of May. This guy starts May 27th in, in Spain, his tour. So look, we're probably, you know, when right before HTT or whatever, or when we're doing our press and we're just talking to everybody all day in a row, <laughs> probably just these three heads on our earth thing. <laughs> he will be like, what was that? <laughs> That's we're done. Yeah. But yeah. You know what we should do though? Like we what need to make sure that we have time so, and we can just, you know, we want to ask them. So we see your tour is huge. 
tell us about this band and you know as far as all the new things because yeah. sometimes we go so long and then yeah. i know you're he right might not, he might not have that kind of time so we got to get through the early stuff fast okay now we right. got to get him in and, wants- and out he's very busy he does, and and Anne did mention his girl did mention that he wants to talk about this tour. Don't don't forget the early stuff. They want the early stuff, but wants to okay. focus on the tour coming, and especially over here when he comes over. Yeah, here. and we can. Because I'm glad you said it that way. Because I'll make sure. Yeah, yeah. We'll of, make sure to say, look, we can't keep you. We know you're super busy, et cetera. So he doesn't think he's doomed with us. I, I, I've reduced my. <laughs> He'll be like, oh no, she wants to know about my early childhood. <laughs> well, I've, I've reduced my notes to a few factoids. So cause... I was just going to say, let's skip his childhood and get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I need to, I got, but we can uh, truncate that. We oh. can it, but I need to yeah. ask about instruments, the urinal, the blades. I need to know about the urinal. Elvis we all need and, to know. Elvis and McCartney and that business, uh, his daughter uh, and, and fingering the flute, uh, uh, and, and of course, the Zealot Gene, his new album, all new songs, not for 23 years has this happened. So this is a big deal. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, sure. So we want to get to that too. But man, he's appointed member of the Order of the British Empire. That'd be like us being, you are a member of the Order of the United States of America. Wow, I am cool. <laughs> no, yeah. That's like, yeah. Not going to happen. No. Now listen. If for some reason, because Ian is calling from England, okay? It's 4.30 p.m. in England. Is that why um, I got up so early? Yep. <laughs> so now we have to uh, uh, acknowledge that if there's any problem, it could happen because it's 8.29 and he's doing a minute. Uh, so if, if anything I'm happens, actually very nervous and I can't wait to see if he's let punctual. Let everyone know. I know. When he comes up, I go, are you... So you want to talk to us, huh? That is so cool of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> like he's like, who are you? Why are you even saying it like that? <laughs> we almost feel not worthy. But no we idea who worthy. we are. But you don't know we're worthy. And listen, listen, I'm going to say, Ian, have you ever heard of the Partridge family? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't do this. But okay, it, okay, I won't. <laughs> I'll, I'll think it's yes, but my, but my self-image and my ego will think uh, well, it's really a no. Better than asking him if he's ever heard of the castles, and he says no. <laughs> yeah, or maybe he wants us to open up a few shows for him. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it would be great. Well, the last, the newest album, he's combining pop and some other element. You know, uh, that kind who of knows? kind of artist. Hey, Tom Petty wanted the Bangles to do backgrounds. Ian Anderson wanting us to do backgrounds isn't that far fetched? Come on, you got to do it. Well, we certainly know he's not done recording <laughs> or doing yeah. anything. Evidently, wow. the guy's a doer. <laughs> Ladies. Uh, he is. He's... And let's alert everyone. Everything you hear on this episode, if Ian makes it in here, <laughs> everything you, you can look it up, you can hear it, you can see it, you can watch it, yeah. and, and go down these holes with us, you guys, because these this guys are genius, are y'all. Amazing. He's got a website, uh, jethrotel.com. But go there's a section called the attic, okay, on, on that website. Just go into it. And this guy kept everything. You know how we kept nothing? Death Row Doll. Man send us stuff. Man send us stuff. Yeah. This man kept everything and it's in the attic. And it's what so- if he never shows up? Oh my, really? He keeps if it. If he never shows up, we're gonna we're gonna fill them in on this stuff. We'll Let's talk just talk about him, about him if he yeah, can't we'll make it for any reason. Things that we're talking about. But it's it'd be fun. It's funny. It's like you do get kind of nervous on the big ones. Let's see. I do. Oh, I was this way with Pat Boone, Steve Van Zandt, um, even Joe Piscopo. I was like, okay. I'm you were nervous floor. with Bill Medley. Remember, Bill you forgot Michelle. to press record. Uh, oh, Bill Medley. But he was, was so that, sweet. That wasn't because of nervous of Bill Medley. That was new oh. podcasting. <laughs> oh, that was early in the day, and, wasn't oh, it? I'm the pilot. <laughs> Dude, you know That's what I remember right. from that? <laughs> what I remember from that, you were so, you were cute because Bill was like, you're all like, yeah, you know, something went screwy. And he said, I got nothing else to do. Where are we going? It's a pandemic. Yeah. And Bob goes, well, seeing as though you feel that way about it, I'll just <laughs> tell you the truth. I forgot to push record. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, what, 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 and Bill was like, guys, yeah, let's roll. Guys, what we're talking about is, I'm, you don't know this, everybody, but on the Bill Medley episode of the podcast, <laughs> I forgot to hit record. And we had a talk. It was about 10 minutes in. It, it wasn't too bad. But at 10 minutes in, I'm sitting here and I look up at my left and 
from that day forward, I always look up to my left because the word recording shows and the word recording, which is there right now, wasn't there. And I had to, and Bill's <laughs> in the middle of a, of a good story and I had to interrupt and say, Ian Anderson himself, himself too. Himself Him is too. here. <laughs> His name is in the square. This is too much. I can't believe it. Hey, you guys, he's really here, and this is really happening. It, it's it's kind of a pre-excitement, isn't it? I know. <laughs> but, so name. look at yeah, when I'm, he gets here, let's yeah. let him get settled, because we're oh, going to no, be very will. excited. Don't jump on him. Here he is. Wow. We all know, obviously, everything you have done. You are, you are, you've been uh, uh, the soundtrack of all of our lives. Um, but I kind of like to start off a little early, and we won't spend a whole lot of time there. But I do like to find out when, when you're born in Scotland, and your your dad and your mom, and it's you, and you're four years old. Are you already thinking you're going to be Jethro Tull guy, or do you want to maybe be a fireman, maybe a garbage man, maybe you want to fish? Did Ian Anderson have any other? kind of thing he was he was wanting to do now i've read about you you do everything so must have been difficult well at the age of four i didn't really have um you know well-formed or defined ambitions um, other than to play in the garden and um just sort of enjoy my early years but probably around the time that i was four or five i suppose i had begun to have an interest in in drawing and painting at some primitive level, but that didn't really develop until I was perhaps eight or nine years old. And then I would have described myself as a sensitive artistic child <laughs> um, <laughs> who didn't didn't particularly like sports. Although for some oh. weird reason, I seem to be quite good at playing sports. I just didn't like the competitiveness and the ah. and the um, the the jostling of boys sometimes who were larger than I was. And um, so I, I, I thought of myself probably as being more allied to the artistic world. And when I went on to be a teenager, then painting and drawing were the, the first pursuit. But when I was studying painting and drawing at an art college when I was 17 or 18, that's when I decided that music offered a, a more immediate outlet for being creative and still getting pushed around by larger boys. Okay. Uh, can I, can with I weapons ask, known as instruments. Go, Bob. Something very specific because we're in this time. We've got to get through this. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I have one question about your grammar school because yep. we went to grammar school and we went to Catholic school and it was rough and tumble back then. Okay. It says that you left grammar school because you didn't agree with corporal punishment. And I get that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we had that too. The nuns were horrific. But my question to you is why didn't you just decide to behave rather than leave? <laughs> Uh, well, it was a point of principle. I think I was 16 years old when, um, or maybe I just, perhaps I was 17 by then. I really don't quite recall what, um, what exactly the age, but it, it, it was a, it was an ultimatum. Really, I was, I was um, hauled in by the headmaster for some misdemeanor, and gave me the option of being beaten on the bottom with a cane or um, no. being thrown out of school. And I, I said, well, I'm very happy to take some other form of punishment to atone for my sins. But I just <laughs> don't really feel that good about being um, beaten by um, an old guy who seems to get some kind of a kick out of doing it. And, um, and so he said, well, you're going to have to go. and uh, You have to leave then. So yeah, he was, I think, calling my bluff. So I called his. <laughs> and uh, we, part we parted company on, on that... Um, on that particular note, it just there just was no going back either okay. for me clearly, and probably not for him either. I my, think my, father, my father strangely supported my decision, which Whoa. surprised oh. me because I thought he would drag me by the scruff of the neck back to school to apologise and accept the uh, the beating. But nice. um, no, that was uh, he, he actually supported me, which was was uh, was wow. something I positively remember. Yeah, that's a good memory because you're right. Our dad would have done what what your dad didn't do. The other question I have quickly, I'm very fascinated by the blades. So you're 15 years old, I think it says anyway in the literature that you're going to start a group, the blades, you're the lead singer. It's going to be souls and blue blues. What, what music is, is that what's influencing you right then where you thought you could start a band? Clearly you're active. You're singing somewhere before the blades, right? 
Well, this is probably at the age of 16 or 17, around that yeah. time. Um, just just before I went, just before I, I left school and went to art college, it was, um, so it, you know, it was a typical three guys actually getting together at school, one of whom had studied music and played piano but wanted to play drums and one who didn't play anything at all, who we said, to him, well, in that case, you'll have to be the bass player. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we, given there's only four strings and it's easier to do, so yeah. he um, he became the bass player, and there were three of us. And then we added, actually, you know, the the, uh, the John Evans, the drummer, he switched to playing Hammond organ um, yeah. since he, he had keyboard skills as a child. And then uh, we got a drummer, and so we became a four piece. And and yes, I was the I was the singer, and most of what we listened to was black american folk music that oh. they call the blues there were a few white guys in the mix like mose allison um one or two of the the imitators in the uk who like us were fascinated by that kind of music so there were bands like manfred mann and the animals who who drew upon some elements of um black american music yep. rhythm and blues as it was called back then not the rhythm and blues of today but but it was um it was a it was an early but devoted start to something that for me seemed like a gateway but no more than that because i i knew that i couldn't or i shouldn't make a living out of imitating and copying other people who, for whom for whom i had huge respect in terms of their music and their culture and their background the more i learned about it the more i realized that this was something i couldn't really do justice to because i didn't have that black experience and that that wow. cultural identity, which I felt was important to have as a musician, you have to be true to something. So I decided better to be true to my European roots wow. and be influenced more by folk music and classical music rather than by jazz and blues. I mean, jazz was much too difficult. Blues was sort of easy and straightforward and a great platform for learning to play your instrument. But I, I thought um, I thought I should try and be more of a European artist rather than a rather than being hock to Americana, so which at, most at that, bands tended to do. <clears throat> at that point then, oh, Polly, go ahead. You had something? Well, I was just going to ask, so any formal training, I mean, the way you picked up these instruments and you mm -hmm. learned like the flute in two months, but I got to just before we go there, your guitar playing is incredible. Yeah. Okay, when I hear your guitar playing, I mean, it's, it's singing. Is it's beautiful. Yeah, so I think you're hard on yourself there for sure. But any formal training at all in music no no not for me no no i i am um, i am self-taught in everything oh, wow. um, self you know from uh i, I th that's actually the reason that i don't have a driving license because you actually have to pass a test to get a driving license and <laughs> and so uh, being a self-taught driver you would have maybe a little difficult in keeping difficulty in keeping up with me in an extreme off-road situation because that's <laughs> what i know but on 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 the uh, on the um, on the highway, um, then I would just turn into Jello because I don't take kindly to other motorists who tend to be travelling at speed and and fifty percent of the time in the opposite direction, which makes it even more scary. So uh, I, I, am, I am I am self taught, which is a, a bit oh. of a weak excuse for just being too too oh, afraid no. to be put to the test and pass a, but, pass but an exam Ian, or Ian. A, whatever. Ian, you poor guy. Yeah, you're very because like you got all this. You have all this, all this um, gift in your body and head, honey. That must have hurt a little bit because if you really, this all comes from inside of you. You are quite a force of nature, sir. Um, well, I think the thing is, when when you're a teenager, you're full of um, yeah. conflicting emotions and and lots of ideas. Some of which are creative. Some of which are just gut level responses to the hormonal surge of youth. <laughs> But um, in in my case, I think I turned it pretty early to being, you know, trying to write songs. So although my first attempts, age 17 or 18, weren't very good, by the time I was 20, then I was on a roll. And, and then by the time we recorded our first album, which was very much um, based on elements of blues music, I, I began writing the... Um, the success, the successor to that, and and 
and clearly that was going to be a very different piece of musical work and and we fell out therefore with our original guitar player who didn't really want to do something outside the framework of blues and rock and roll oh wow so um I, you know by the time i was um what was i i would be 20 21 years old when i wrote the second album and and so at that point i really felt i was i, I you know i felt it, it was a brave adventure, but I did find it quite fulfilling because I think I had confidence in my own songs as being, if nothing else, at least different to what most other people were playing. And yeah, being different definitely. isn't always good, but it's, a, it's certainly a start when it comes to getting noticed in a crowd. Um, that's why I think Jethro Tull was noticed, partly because the music was a little different, but also because the flute as a lead instrument yeah. set us apart from pretty much everybody else. Well, let me. You sold more flutes when you came out. We all bought a flute and we all went to the park, sat in a big circle, and tried to do the flute. Mm. And 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 then mm. later on in life, here, I mean, that you did it in two months. Wait till I tell my friends how long it took you and how long we never even got it done. So. Well, it was actually. It was just before Christmas of 1967 when I, I, mean, I had owned a flute for about three or four months at that point, but I couldn't get a note out of it. You know, I huffed yeah. and I puffed and nothing happened except I got a bit dizzy and fell over. Yeah. But suddenly, just before Christmas, somebody explained to me, well, it's like blowing into, the, into a, a beer bottle. Yeah. You know, blow across the top. And, and so yeah. I, I did that and suddenly I had a note. <laughs> and ten, ten minutes later, I had two or three notes. And um, there's your formal training. After, eh? after an hour, I had five notes. I could play the pentatonic scale. I could play the blues. And so I, I took what I knew right. about guitar playing and just imitated what I would do in an improvised guitar solo and Ooh, did that on yes. the flute with a few notes that I could play. And and that was, as I say, pr probably mid-December. By mid, well, certainly by the end of January, when Jethro Tull became Jethro Tull, which is, you know, some four or five weeks later, then I was playing the flute on stage at the Marquee, which is yeah. where we got notice. So I, I guess the... You know, it was, it, was a, it was a steep learning curve, at least to getting to the point where I could entertain myself <laughs> importantly by playing the flute and, right. I, and 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 obviously it made its impression on the audiences and um well we've never seen set anything us apart, as i said we've never seen anything like it up until no, we had I not mean, we're, we're all we're all uh the beatles we're all the yeah, the british invasion we're all um uh you show up almost like a character too by the way uh, you're your front you're a great front man and we're just <laughs> we're just looking at you going you are so different and the music yeah. was so and brought us into a different realm kind of like motown did with us during the beatles time mm -hmm. we did motown and the beatles we love motown mm -hmm. you kind of got the feeling you were being educated you yeah, knew it, you were hearing something a little higher end and you liked it so you felt cool okay and i, I think I ian, at the time, ian i think ian was a bit scary looking to a lot of us as well <laughs> because his approach on stage you know was like Really yeah. different. It's cool. Riveting. Well, I, I, I think I must have been a bit scary, um, at least as far as the girls were concerned, because all the other, <laughs> all the other, you know, pop and rock bands of the time were yes. getting, uh, you know, very successful in attracting the attentions of willing young ladies, whereas they yeah. they never seemed to come near me. So our <laughs> audience began really by being almost completely a male audience, but maybe. A little later on, because boys would bring their girlfriends or, yeah. mm -hmm. or their mother, <laughs> or these days, <laughs> or these days, their their granddaughter. Oh my uh, gosh! Then, yeah, these days your audience it, is a lot different. Yeah, I mean, it, it turned into. I mean, last I'm just thinking. Last night I was on stage in London playing in a at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, and I'm just scanning across the audience, and I would have said it was probably only 25, 30 percent female from. I wasn't really thinking that hard about it, but uh, right. you know, I remember making eye contact with a few females that I could see in the front two or three rows. But I, I would have said it was probably 60, 70 percent male, which is unusual because I, I think of it more these days of being around 50 50 when we play. Yeah, you would. Thing. in europe generally speaking absolutely i know my best friend from second grade from saint augustine's was a huge jethro tall fan she would bring linda ryan you guys just loved him that's how i learned about jethro tall was through linda ryan <laughs> wow. Okay. wow i, I have well, one odd question if you don't mind yeah okay. 
It's about the urinal. And it, 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 let's make it very quick. So in, in like <laughs> 67, you're cleaning the bathrooms at the Ritz Cinema, okay? And when you leave, you take this urinal with you. Was that I, I'm assuming a memento of a of a of a life that you had there, and maybe a memory of it. But it's gonna. I know it's not this one, but everyone knows about this urinal hooked up to the Hammond on stage in, in your band, right? I mean, mm -hmm. was was this? Did you go? Did you look at that urinal and just make? Did it make you sing better or something? Because you didn't want to go back to that. What's the story, <laughs> what Ian? On? With the well, the thing, about, the thing about it was I, I was cleaning the cinema. That was my job. I, I only worked there for two or three weeks, but um, I had to keep all the cleaning equipment in a storeroom. And in the storeroom at the back of the cinema, there happened to be various bits and pieces that were the, um, you know, broken items, old chairs and various things. And there was a urinal which had a big crack in it. I mean, it had a you know, quite a quite a noticeable crack. I mean, well, it was definitely never going to be used again by the cinema <laughs> or indeed anybody else except me. And in fact, you know, this this was made of porcelain. I mean, it was heavy. Yeah. Yes. And um, and I staggered home with this thing only because <laughs> only because no one was going to use it. And I thought, well, it's a shame to throw it away. I'll I'll take it home and see if I can find a use for it. And maybe in the back of my head, I thought maybe I shall take to. Um, you know, uh, culturing some exotic fruit or use it as a, you know, plant pot for something that I could grow. And that would be a yeah, you know, yeah. creative and interesting thing to do. But wow. it, it just, yeah. it just, it ended up just gathering dust. And, and later on, yeah. we, um, we, we used not that urinal, but a much more practical, lightweight plastic one. <laughs> <laughs> which was attached to the side of the Hammond organ. And our keyboard player, John Evans, would, um, you know, while something else was going on, like perhaps while I was talking or introducing a song, oh, no. he would upstage me by going over to the urinal with no. his back to the audience and no. appear to sort of undo his trousers and appear to take a pee. And then, you know, shaking it and then turning it round and with his flies still open to the audience. Oh, which I thought this was, <laughs> was wonderful and very funny. <laughs> Yeah, but um, hey, but it, it was just it was just a spoof. I mean, it was um, okay. You so you intentionally just, put that urinal there to do that. You did that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people people obviously remember it as being yeah, something that was a little bit of absurd stagecraft. But the, remember, this was the time. This was probably nineteen seventy two. So this was the the period oh. when British comedy was very much informed by Monty Python, who were a ah, natural yeah. evolution from some yeah. earlier forms of British comedy. Um, and <laughs> and Python's, it was a surreal humour. It was something that was quite schoolboy, quite childish oh, yeah. in a way, but it had a surreal quality because of context. It was doing things that seemed everyday things, but you put them out of context, and then they became very funny. At least 50% yeah. of the time with Python, it was very <laughs> Very funny. The other fifty percent of the time, I think they groaned as much as the rest of us. But <laughs> none, nonetheless, it was surreal British humour, and and so that that developed into That's some of the line. elements okay. that we used in in our stage performances, which people remembered. You know, things like um, a telephone that went off in the middle of some delicate piece of music. The phone would ring it on the stage, and a spotlight would catch it on a on a stool, and I would go over and take a call, and whatever happened, whatever happened, it was just. Um, we we did a few things like that, which were we, we call to that... us to us seemed amusing to the American audience at the time. They weren't really quite sure what was going on, and I think it was the the mystery and the little bit of confusion that went with it that people really remembered. Whereas in the UK, they just thought, "Oh yeah, there's a guy taking a pee in a urine." Oh, and the phone went off on stage. It was just, to them they they <laughs> it was the kind of humour they knew all too well. So it didn't seem so um, so radical, perhaps, as it did in the USA or in Japan, where it was so radical they just stared yeah. at us and didn't react at all. Just stony silence. Oh, oh. I can't even they, imagine. They didn't get that. it at all. All oh right, we should talk about new music, you guys. Well, I did have a question. So, Ian, when you go out on this tour that is coming up, it's staring you right in the face. Um, are you going to do the whole new album? Or do you, is this can you the do... Zealot Gene tour? <laughs> no, the, the Zealot Gene was uh, actually seven of the tracks, um, were the backing tracks, at least the, the most of what the band did, were recorded back in 2017. And I finished four of them by the end of 2017. But 2018, I didn't get around to finishing stuff because 
or, or getting the guys back together to record the other five songs uh, because of the pressure of touring. And then, of course, 2019, COVID came along and, uh, and 2020 and 2021 were pretty much a write-off. So I decided I would have to finish the album by myself at home in summer of 2021. And uh, it was released in January of 2022. So it, it was some four and a half years, really, between wow. beginning it and actually having it released. And we can blame part of that, at least on COVID. But right. at the same time, January of 2022, before the Zealot Gene, or was, yeah, just before the Zealot Gene was released, I started work on a new project, which was to become Rock Flutter. And yep. that is the album that is currently came out about two or three weeks ago. And I mean, we, 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 play, we play a couple of songs from the Zealot Gene. We play a couple of songs from the new album. But the days of doing an entire new album and staging it as a grand event, I think that, I think that that probably died a death about ten, fifteen years ago. That, that audiences didn't really come to see old timers like us and then be yep. bombarded with an hour of strange music. Uh, yep. They 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 wanted to um, they wanted to hear a cross section of the of the discography that they're familiar with. Yeah. And. And luckily, having a, a pretty large repertoire of music since 1968, I, I decided that we should bill the latter part of this year's tours as Jethro Tull, The Seven Decades, because we oh, began nice. in the 60s and, and, uh, and continued nice. through to, the, to the, um, the 2020s. So although it's not, it's not seven, 70 years of music, but it is uh, uh, something from each decade, um, sometimes a few songs, sometimes just one or two from each decade that we that we have um, released albums in. That's a great tell, idea. Let me, tell Go ahead, folks, let me tell the folks something. So Jethro Tull, they start May 27th in Vigo, Spain. This is all over the world, folks. I mean, they're going Spain, Slovenia, Austria, Italy, Germany, over here, back to there, over here. Um, they're at the Greek Theater <laughs> September 27th. I mentioned that because that's our backyard, Ian. They're at the Greek Theater September 27th, mm -hmm. everybody. And that's a- Yeah, can we get theater. tickets? Just kidding. <laughs> but, but Ian, you're, you're, very, you're very prolific. You have spent, it seems like half your life in the studio creating. You never stop. Uh, and, and the touring, it's just so magnificent. We're just blown away by you. And we just wanted to let everyone yeah. know. Inspired. Okay. Just inspired. Just go read about you. Well, I, you can't I, let this become a documentary. I, 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 I know that. I know that you guys are still active, performing music too, and that um, is probably easy for all of us, all of us, to explain because there is that sense that you get older, or just get old, that yeah. you realise this is not, however much you might want it to, it's not going to go on forever and therefore it would seem a terrible shame a terrible waste not to use these years when you still can be productive yes, yes. right and, and just say oh i think i'm just gonna you know i'm just gonna go fishing or play golf or do something <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I know that this will this will come to an end all too soon so whilst i'm not anxious to go away and do six week tours i am quite anxious to do you know two or three shows a week if i can yeah, sure. particularly yeah. in Europe, I can I can jump on a plane and and or sometimes even on a train and go and do two or three concerts and then come home and spend a few nights in my own bed. Okay. And then I feel energized to go out and, and do do it again. But the days of going away for weeks and weeks on end, that that is just absolutely unattractive, which is why we, we're doing three short U.S. tours this year, whereas most people would just do one tour with all the shows in it. You know, one after the I other. I think you have earned. I think you've feeling, earned the right to incredible. pace it any way you please to. Before <laughs> yes, but the the the, the, the downside of all of this, of course, is a, a inevitably, and at least as far as long haul destinations are concerned, is a lot more travel. So you know, my carbon That's footprint it. this year will be oh, yeah. just just through my three return flights to the USA will be a massive number of tons, and I can oh. sell my I can sell myself only in part by the fact that. We did plant another 10,000 trees last year. So um, during the time that we've lived uh, here, and, and some of them, you know, are now, um, you know, we're, we're probably talking, uh, I'm trying to put this back into feet and inches again, because we're, we're all metric, at least <laughs> I am. Um, you know, we're, we're talking trees now that are some of them 35, 40 feet high. And, and it's very, 
that they really do look like proper trees, not just like little skinny things you know, yeah. Yeah. growing a little yeah. bit bigger than yeah. the new one. May I ask, what is this? Where do you do this? You have an organization. Uh, uh, I, I know a lot of folks do, but could you just say what it is in case? Yes, people I, I, have, I have. An, I have an organization that takes Thank care you. of all of this for me and does all the work while I take Fantastic. all the credit. And the name of the organization, you should make a note of this. The name of the organization is my wife. Because she's the, one, she's the one who looks after the, and always has looked after the land farming and um, that side of things. Whereas for 20 years, I goofed off back in the, the late 70s um, yeah. and became Shona runs the, the tree. aquaculturalist of the family. Okay. So I was, I was involved in marine aquaculture and she was doing the land farming, which was a nice split because we didn't interfere too much with each other's um urges to uh to do that both from a creative point of view and from a business point of view so hmm. i did the i did the wet yeah. stuff and she did the dry yeah. stuff basically Mr. so these Anderson. days she, she takes care mostly of the um organization of tree planting of, awesome. of the thinning of the felling of the general oh management my God. <clears throat> is there anything the... you haven't dipped your branch i mean you do everything i mean you must it's amazing. I, well, you know, there's, 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 there are a lot of people out there in our business who just say, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the guitar player, or I'm, I'm, I'm the singer." You know, we, I, I have, I have my people who do this sort of thing, um, organizing tours, booking shows, booking air tickets, doing um, all the mm -hmm. organization tour itineraries, and so on and so forth. I have my people do that. I, I, I know that's what they say because some of my friends who are musicians refer to my people. My, my, <laughs> my, my, my son-in-law, who's an, a, an actor, he refers to my people. You know, to, uh, my, my oh. people are booking the flights, you know. Well, oh, okay. I, I always took a, an interest in the business side of, of uh, the, the, the music industry right from the very beginning. I tried to learn about you know about record production, most obviously, but then the the business side of things about record contracts, right. about international tax, you know, withholding really taxes and all that sort of stuff. It contracts, budgets, all of these things really interested oh, wow. me. And so, taking possession of that part of your life is maybe a bigger workload. But on the other hand, I sleep well at night because I I'm not worried about somebody else messing up. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is, if you if you have a tour manager and you say, OK, you organize the tour, you know, and, and, and then the tour manager goes to a, a travel agent and they book hotels and flights and then do an itinerary. And then I see it. And I, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to fly that airline. I don't want to right? fly that time of the day. I, <laughs> You know, I so it's, I just became so much easier to do these things myself. And by the time the internet came along, towards the end of the 1990s, it became far more practical for me to do not just the research in terms of what flight I wanted to be on or what hotel I wanted to stay in. But while I was on that site, just press the button, pay the money, and it's done. Because <laughs> by, the time, by the time you've explained to somebody else what to do, oh, yeah. it's, just, it's just as much work, and they may still... You know, they may still mess yeah. up. And so I, I just do all these things quite happily. I'm a Sunday Sunday morning travel agent. You know, Love if you it. need a flight booking, just give me a call early Sunday I'll morning. Take I'll take care of it. We're going to call yeah. you. Hey, yeah. Be Go ahead, Bob. Before we let you, go, we get going on a bit here with you. I know I do. Can I ask you a question about your daughter? So it, it's known that your daughter learned the flute. And I happen to notice you taught yourself incorrectly uh, in a way how to play the flute. And, and then apparently after she showed you, it says that you were compelled to relearn your own stuff correctly. I mean, most people would have said to their daughter, hey, I did it my way at work, you know, good for your way. But you you seemed at that point in your life to compelled to redo this correctly. What, what well, yes, when, 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 your, when your 10 year old daughter says, hey daddy, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's a bit of a spur in terms of um, it, huh? <laughs> making making you grapple with the fact that you're being self-taught. There were lots of things that I in just incorrect fingering, basically that that I managed wow. by playing harmonics and by just brute force i could get the notes out roughly in tune and, <laughs> and do the job and I, I i'm doing that basically for about 30 years i suppose by the time i sure. 
or at least 25 years. By the time that I grabbed the bull by the horns and forced myself to get a fingering chart for the flute. In fact, I was, I was in India. I was in the Air India, um, next door to the Air India um, uh, site in, in, in Bombay, as it was called then, the day after the, it was blown up by terrorists. Oh and so I, I was pretty much the only guy in town. So all, all the media came to my press conference and um, I was in in a hotel next door to the Air India building, and it had a fax machine. So to kill a bit of time, when I was waiting for the uh, press stuff to start, I I got in touch with an English flute shop and said, "Can you send me a fingering chart for the flute? Uh, send it by fax to this number." And sure enough, a few minutes later, the fax rattled in my room, and I came a piece of paper with a with a with a flute fingering chart. So I I persevered manfully for about two or three months just one at a time relearning <laughs> all of my all of my music but using the correct fingering and it was it was it was like um it's it probably a little bit like trying to ride a ride a bicycle with your hands crossed over in front of oh you and everything right. <laughs> just, sure. just didn't work you know yeah yeah and um so I I, I had a few bicycle wrecks on stage for the first <laughs> few months while I was getting all of this into my head. But I think after three or four months, I was just about, you know, it had got all, I, I, it had become second nature again to use the correct fingering. Okay. And, wow. and I, I use the correct fingering obviously now, but I still find many of the things that I used to play were a whole lot easier, even though they were technically <laughs> wrong. Okay. But um, I, I have a I have a bent little finger, you see, so mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work very well, this finger. And in using oh. the correct fingering, you, you use this um, uh, quite a lot on the D sharp key to play yeah, most of the close. notes in the, in the, in the first bent? and second octave. Has it always been bent? Yeah, yeah. Oh, far out. Yes, it was a, it was um, just, just something. Opening out. Um, it's a pr pretty common, a pretty common. Uh, I forget the name of the name of it, but it's just the tendon in here when you're in the womb. You know, it doesn't straighten oh, out, out, and and so you you you're born with with this okay. the tendon. And when when I was a boy, when I was quite young, they they said, well, we can we can cut the tendon and straighten it out. But it will be then permanently straight. So uh, imagine spending your life walking around with a finger like this. <laughs> no, 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 no. On balance, I think I'd, I'd settle for the bent one, and uh, it, it works, but just not very well. So I'm, right. I'm, I do sometimes. If you hear a wrong note from me on stage, and last night there were a few of them, I should think at least half of them is because this finger just doesn't do what my brain is saying do that and it doesn't it just Aww. just seizes up you know so, so yeah. I, that, that's my that's that's my somewhat weak excuse for playing a lot of bum notes and making offensive noises i dare um, say you do not play I, offensive probably not bum note maybe <laughs> yep yep there's a few of them there's right. a few do of them. Back to, do you get back to blackpool very often are you are your strong memories there do you yeah. bring your kids around to your school i i no i i've been to blackpool a few times because one of the members of the band Still lives not actually in Blackpool, but in a small town just uh, twenty minutes away. And um, and I, I, well, in fact, I spoke to him yesterday. In fact, to see how he was doing. I, I, that's about the only reason I think I would go back to Blackpool because I have no relatives there. Yeah. Um, my my parents are buried actually quite close to where Jeffrey, the bass player, lives to this day. Um, so I've, I've been back a couple of times just to look at my parents' grave and see if there's any sign of movement, but sadly not. <gasps> and um, go back and, and check to, again, uh, and, and to see old Jeffrey because he's um, he's a full time painter since he left Jethro Tull in 1976, That's and wow. has spent all of his time just amassing this huge collection of paintings, which are now, in fact, um, uh, visible online. He has a website showing oh, most. Tell us most of his uh, of his artwork i think it's probably just jeffrey uh, com or something of that sort but it's his, uh, his um his art gallery of all his work and lovely so lovely. yes he's, he's he's probably the only reason i'd go back but it, it you know the thing is when you leave a part of your life behind there are those who have a nostalgia that drags them back every so often and yeah. i feel a little more that way about edinburgh which is where I, from the age of three until 12, mm -hmm. I lived in Edinburgh. And that is a, 
beautiful city and one that does draw me back because of its uniqueness and I suppose partly because of its its history and its culture, whereas Blackpool is a holiday resort of post-Victorian. Mm. Oh, um, sounds lovely. Well, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like, um, you know, it's a bit like, um, you know, sort of holiday resort you might find in, in New Jersey or somewhere. It's a, it's, it's a, it's oh, a, okay, a not, lovely. not exactly a boardwalk, but a promenade of places where people are just eating and drinking and making a lot of noise. And then in the, in the winter, it's just, desolate which is yeah. kind of okay because i quite I like, like winters in blackpool when there were no tourists but um it was just me and the seagulls nice well, Ian, we have so enjoyed having you this has been uh, um amazing i think this is one of our this is one of my biggest this is uh, like too big can I ask we're always we're thing. always amazed when when an artist like yourself says, "Yeah, I'll do the Council podcast." <laughs> yeah, because we always wonder, do these guys even know who we are? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't need a bump in your career. <laughs> well, I I did know who you were, but I like as I would do with many journalists and many people. I, it takes just a few minutes to to look them up, check them out, and see what they 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 were up to both then mm -hmm. and now. So I I spent right. actually early this morning I was I was listening to several bits of your music and performances back when in sixty eight and and also um um and um, you know more recent shows and it it's it's always interesting to know there are people who like me just feel compelled to to defy age and defy yeah. gravity by, <laughs> by, by, by keeping sagging, sagging chins at least aloft oh, for the, uh, yeah. the I'm with people you. in the front row. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, you it's, are as, 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 you, saying here's, that. here's the tip. Here's the tip. As you get older, put the microphone stand a little higher, oh. which then means you have to do this. Oh, and, yeah. And, and like guess it. what? Wait, guess what? I'll add to that. If anybody accuses you of doing it for vanity, you simply tell them, because I have. No, no. It's just easier for me to emote from my voice if I'm stretching this way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, real well, quick, real quick. It we is. know what happens to us in a show. We have 60 cities coming as this summer. We got to pace this, right? And we know what happens, what you can't let happen to you, or your singing is going to be hard. As a flute player, I, even back then, we would, I would watch you and, and see you and go, "What? How does that guy get sick? How does he play that thing? What happens to him if you get a cold? What gets?" Mm, in the well, way what of happens playing? to me if I get COVID? Is the has been the concern of recent times, and oh, if yeah. everybody else gets COVID, I, I do actually have. As we've had to use it three times. Um, a secret weapon, which is we recorded a, a live show at the beginning of um, 2022. Uh, we, we recorded everybody performing um, and then updated it with when we changed the set list with some other additions so that they are they, they, they constitute what we call the COVID tape. So if somebody gets COVID and, and oh. obviously then can't travel with everybody else because of passing it on, then um, we uh, we give the promoter the option. Good. I mean, I don't want to do it. I'm always hoping the promoter will say, no, 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 we have to cancel the concert. But they of never course, do. They always say, yes, we're desperate. You, you must do the show. And and so we we go on and play without the missing member um, and um, and explain to the audience it was either that or cancel the show. So count yourselves lucky. And and it's very embarrassing it's to have to do, but it's better than a cancellation because... No, no. It's a very good idea, Ian. Mm. It's a good, it's a practical replacement. I know a lot yeah. of our friends on really big tours who their COVID thing is so tight because if they lose one member of a super group, Stevie mm. Nicks, you can't just call up Joe Guy and put him in. You know, you have no, to no, cancel. No, no. And yeah, so- we were talking. Yes. I mean, I, I've, had, I've had people on two occasions get uh, COVID- um, maybe three or four days before a tour, but they were still obviously going to be infectious, so they they couldn't do it. Right. But there've been also two occasions when somebody got COVID, literally, the day before, or even once on the morning of a show. Oh, he came cool. down came down to breakfast on the morning of a show in Poland, first first date, and and uh, said, "Oh, not feeling too good," and you know, but sore throat. And I said, "Quickly go go and you know do it, dude, because we carry." tests with us right. all the time and <laughs> and so he went upstairs and did a test and it came up positive and so 
we um that meant he, obviously he couldn't do it but he was the lighting guy so my son was actually there covering for the drummer because he got covid two days before oh, so my son my son had 40 48 hours to learn the entire show oh, and um, it came to play the drums but then the lighting guy went down with it as well so my my son decided what? okay i'm going to do i'm going to do the lights and we'll use the uh, scott the drummer's covid tape instead so we played awesome. Awesome. played three shows in poland without a drummer i said no it's not wow. true no no scott scott had obviously had it for a while before he knew and so he he rejoined for the last show in Crazy. poland having having tested negative but um the, the, these awesome. have been the facts of life and, and the only person yes. i don't have a covid tape for is me because <laughs> if I get COVID, then well, it is going to be a cancellation, that. and uh, so I, I go to a lot of trouble. I mean, you, you, you're enjoying a very special, privileged uh, um, uh, interview with me here because most of my mo most of my Zoom interviews, I wear my mask just to be just ah. to be double careful. <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> Oh my God, Mr. Ian Anderson, yeah. we're going to let you go, and we are go. so grateful to you for this time you spent. Okay, Boyd. well, very nice to talk to you, and best of luck with your summer concerts. Yeah, and you too, you, you too, Ian. Yeah, Thank take care, Ian. Bye, -bye Godspeed. Now. Bye. Don't forget it. Yeah, y'all. Yeah.